I hope everyone's enjoying their um, their lunch. We're gonna get started with our program this afternoon. It's um it's a real pleasure for me to welcome Fordham class Fordham Prep class of 1976 John McAvoy here today. John is a son a native son of the Bronx. Uh, he and his two brothers went to the Fordham Prep, Bernie 69 and Michael 74. John is currently chairman and chief executive officer of Con Consolidated Edison and CEO of its principal subsidiary, Consolidated Edison Company of New York. John joined Con Edison in 1980. In his last post, he served as president and CEO of Orange and Rockland Utilities, which is a Con Ed subsidiary. Prior to his leadership at Orange and Rockland, he served as Senior Vice President of Central Operations. His responsibilities there included oversight of the electric transmission system, more than 100 substations in and around New York City, the company's primary control center, engineering and construction activities, electric and steam generating plants, and the world's largest steam system. John serves on the board of directors of the American Gas Association, Edison Electric Institute, the Partnership for New York City, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, and the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City. He also serves on the board of trustees of the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. Following his graduation from Fordham Prep, John attended Manhattan College where he received a degree in mechanical engineering. He also holds an MBA from New York University and is a graduate of the David Rockefeller Fellows Program. John and his wife Kathy, a retired high school math teacher, raised their three daughters in Summers, New York. Kelly and Siobhan are high school teachers and graduates of Holy Cross and Providence College. And Jacqueline, a nurse, is a Fairfield University graduate. So the uh, Jesuit education continues to be passed down in the generations at the McAvoy family. And with names like these, I take it you'll be celebrating on March 17th. Although you also have Italian in your background, and John is known to like a good pizza, pizzeria, and uh, uh, from Brooklyn to the Bronx and all over, he can tell you about, about New York pizza. We're also fortunate to have the chairman of our board of trustees, Jim Rowan, class of 1982, return again this year to moderate the Wall Street Forum. It's a special year for us to uh, call Jim out because it is his final year as chairman of the board at Fordham Prep and um, he's leaving an extraordinary legacy of, of hard work, treasure, talent, vision, strategic uh, initiatives um, in the wake of his leadership of the board. Jim is chief operating officer at Renaissance Technologies, which is a global hedge fund management firm Jim is a triple ram having graduated from the prep and Fordham University with both a bachelor's degree and an MBA. And I know we're all looking forward to the conversation, so please join me in welcoming today's speaker, John McAvoy, and our moderator and questioner, Jim Rowan. Thank you. Certainly, balance with, on this yeah, exactly. one, yeah. Certainly with that introduction, you can help me with my utility bill. <laughs> so, <laughs> I can't even turn to look at you. Hang on. So John, if it's all right, maybe we could start high level. Maybe we could talk about how the energy sector, have you seen the energy sector evolve, and how has that affected Conrad? Yes. First, I want to thank you, Jim, Father Devron. Thank you for having me. It's a uh, real privilege to be here with so many other PrEP alumni and others who are associated in the PrEP community and the PrEP family, so thanks for having me. Um, so much going on in the en energy industry, and I'll tell you, much of it is um, very exciting. Uh, a couple of things are driving it. You start, I would start with technology. A lot of technologies that have, we've been working on, in many cases for decades, are either commercial now or close to being a commercial, and in many cases are competitive with more traditional sources of energy, um, sometimes with subsidies, increasingly close to being competitive without subsidies. So uh, electric vehicles, battery storage, fuel cells, solar and, and wind, uh, building management systems, 
Those type of things um, are things that we've talked about for years. When I started in Con Edison in 1980, we were working on a fuel cell. We had a pilot project on 14th Street uh, on the east side. And my predecessor, four times removed, who was CEO, had an electric vehicle. They were experimenting with the same type of things. Today it's commercial, largely competitive, and that's driving a lot of the change. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is so much of those technologies are on the customer side. They're not a new way to build a new central-based power plant. The different ways on the close to where the energy is being consumed to, in many ways, produce, store, and manage um, electricity. And I think that has a lot to do with um, kind of the second thing that's driving it, which is the customer. Um, customers today want more individualization. They want more choice. They want more access to information. And although not all, many want to make their own energy decisions. And so having those new technologies really melds, you know, it, it, the, I'd say the impact of, a, of an Uber type um, environment from the customer side now makes it so many more of those new technologies are being taken advantage of. And the last thing that's driving a lot of the change in the industry today is, uh, is energy policy. And there's a lot of different aspects to energy policy, but in particular, uh, continued focus on lower zero emissions uh, renewable energy and reducing impact on the environment. And there's a lot of different studies out that, that forecast the growth in solar and renewable in this country. Um, pick which one you want. They all show significant increases over the next several decades. That's a big part of where the future is. So, John, that's a, that's a great lead into we've had a change in administration. You had a very kind of global or eco-friendly administration prior. Now we have one that seems to be deregulating easing up on uh, fracking, oil. Uh, do you see that playing a role, or can uh, these um, more green technologies stand on their own? Yeah, so certainly, the, the change in the federal posture on a, on a number of things will, will have an impact. Um, if you look at the, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, their um, most notable um, legislation in the second term of the Obama administration was the Clean Power Plan, um, very significant emissions targets reductions for 2030. Um, but when you focus in closer and look at the Northeast, and in particular New York State, the fact that the Clean Power Plan may not come to fruition, uh, and it was already being challenged in the courts even before the change in, uh, in administration. Um, for New York, we largely already met many of the emissions guidelines. Um, we have virtually no coal in the state. We have about 25% renewable in terms of electric, electricity production, about 25% nuclear, other zero emissions. So really more for New York, more energy policy is driven within the state. Um, one example, the state has a clean energy standard um, that was established by the governor uh, last year. And that requires that renewable energy produce 50% of the electricity consumed in the state by 2030. That is a much more aggressive target that will have much more impact on changes in the energy industry in this state than the federal legislation would have. Okay, I'm gonna, th that leads into the question on Indian Point. Right? In a sense, clean energy, they're talking about maybe shutting it down in 2021. Uh, what does that actually mean? Where is that source of energy going to come from, and will that drive up prices? Yeah, so the, um, the governor and, and the owner of Indian Point Entity uh, announced an agreement, I think it was about a month, month and a half ago, to, to shut the plant down. There are two plants there, one in 2020 and one in 2021, and there's, a, there's an opener if needed to keep it running for, I think, up to another five years. Um, the idea of shutting down Indian Point is, is not something that, that just came upon us in 2016 or a couple. Um, it is something we have been looked at and evaluated and planned for um, most notably, uh, I guess it's about six years ago, 2011, 2010 timeframe, um, knowing that the governor had, um, had established the shutdown of Indian Point as a priority. We worked with the, the New York Independent System Operator and staff at the Public Service Commission to do studies around what would happen if, if the plant shut down by 2016. And we had picked 2016 because one plant's license expired in 2013, the other in 2015, so summer of 2016 would be the first summer, potentially without any Indian point. We saw that the shortfall, and this is real round numbers, was about 1,600 megawatts. Um, and we said, what can we do to, to alleviate that we designed three major transmission projects, um, all of which went into service uh, prior to summer of 2016 as planned. 
That makes up about 700 or 750 of the 1600. We've identified energy efficiency um, improvements specifically targeted to alleviate the loss of Indian Point. We also looked at distributed generation and clean heat and power alternatives. That added about another 200 megawatts. So real round numbers, we already have about 1,000 of the 1,600 megawatts that are needed. Um, unrelated to any policy changes, there have been some plants that have come and gone on the system in New York City and the Lower Hudson Valley, both, but most notably, there's a new plant being built in Orange County. Uh, it's called Clean Power Ventures uh, in the town of Weiwei Yanda. That's about 600 megawatts. So to really know whether or not everything is, is suitable yet for an Indian Point shutdown, the study has to be redone. Um, that's being worked on and will likely be out later this year. But in all likelihood, from a reliability perspective, it's within striking range. Right. And we've got five years to get there. And so the, you know, the, the thought that you have to make up for 2,000 megawatts of Indian Point loss is really a much, much smaller number, probably one that will be manageable. We'll know for certain when the study results are public. Are you familiar enough to talk about the differences between Indian Point and Fukushima, Daiichi? I, I am. Okay, um, good. I, 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 um, in, in full disclosure, I worked at Indian Point for many years early in my career. When it was at the time the Con Edison owned, owned the plant. Um, there were two, two different types of nuclear reactors, primarily a pressurized water reactor and a boiling water reactor. Uh, Indian Point is the PWR. Fukushima Daiichi was a BWR. Uh, and when you look at the, the, the designs are substantially different. Um, that being said, neither plant is designed to have no electricity at all. The, the, the plants um, include a reactor that has decay heat, and to remove the decay heat, you need to have some source of electricity. So the idea that of a total loss of electricity that occurred at Fukushima Daiichi is, is largely an unacceptable condition in any large commercial plant. That being said, um, and I can't speak to the Daiichi design in terms of backup power systems, but the plants, including Indian Point, have multiple backup systems established, a um, lot of regulation around that, and they had to further increase them as a result of the Daiichi uh, situation. Okay. One last question on the topic. Uh, in preparation for this conversation, it seems that the spent rods are too dangerous to move. So when they're talking about closing it down, it's really basically it's going to be somewhat entombed versus uh, hazardous material being moved. Is, is that correct? Um, a, a bit. Uh, the, the main problem with the spent fuel, not just for Indian Point, but at all the nuclear plants throughout the country, is that there is no federal storage facility. Um, one of the things that was established in the 60s was that the federal government agreed they would take all the spent nuclear waste from all power plants. Um, that, that is the agreement under which every plant got licensed. And um, you've heard of, likely of Yucca Mountain. That was going to be the federal storage facility. Billions of dollars were invested in it. Um, it has since gone off the rails, and there is no current plan to finish Yucca Mountain as the storage site. And there uh, is no um, alternative really being actively pursued. So the problem for the plants isn't that it's too dangerous to transport. There are transportation mechanisms. We used to transport nuclear fuel in this country in the 60s and 70s. Other countries do it routinely. The transportation design is there and it's, it's operational. It's that there's no place to put it. And so what happens is it all gets um, uh, put in what's called on-site storage containers. Um, it's not exactly like being entombed. It's more like if you would think of a, a railroad car with a tanker on it. Um, it, it, it specially designed to house and, and to allow heat removal from nuclear fuel, stored, stored in that, generally put on concrete pads outside of the plant where it was previously used. Thank you. Maybe we can move on to global warming and what I guess is now known as uh, developing a res climate resilient infrastructure. Right? We all remember Sandy, many of us uh, either working in the city or uh, in the, where we live felt the uh, impact. So how is Con Ed preparing for global warming, rising tides, heavier storms? Yeah, so a, a little bit on Sandy. Um, our, we had established a design criteria for our system that was based on the highest flood levels ever seen in New York City. It went back to 1821, the hurricane that occurred there, and the highest flood level ever seen at the battery then was 11.1 .1 feet. We had added a little buffer onto that and said we designed everything for 12 and a half feet, almost a foot and a half. Um, that had stood for almost 200 years. 
as, as acceptable. Sandy came in at 14.1 feet, three feet higher than had ever been seen at the battery. And that's why it had such a dramatic impact on our system and, and infrastructure in general. So um, as a result of that, we entered into a climate change collaborative um, with the city and many other third parties. Um, the idea of doing this via a collaborative is that it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if Con Ed has one design criteria, the city has another, and then individual building owners have a third. You really want to all agree on what should we be designing to. And so we, we went through that, we did the climate change studies, had a number of climate change experts, and we agreed to a criteria that's uh, hopefully not too technical here, called FEMA plus three. FEMA we're, issues. We're all Fordham prep grads, it's that, not a problem. <laughs> you can throw it at, throw it aside. We understand. <laughs> Not too, not too technical to be consumed, too technical to be interesting. <laughs> uh, so FEMA lays out flood maps. They put out the 100-year flood map, basically the agreed on design criteria. And of course, FEMA redid the flood maps after Sandy since the world changed. And so we, everything now is being designed to FEMA plus three, so uh, th plus three feet. So we... Um, we implemented a four-year billion dollar uh, resiliency program to, to implement that standard. Um, in many cases, we've worked and been able to find ways that the investment we make, that billion dollars, not only protects us against the next Sandy, but is serving to reduce customer impact and customer outages on normal days. So the, the idea, for example, that during smaller storms, the resiliency benefits in, uh, reduce outages is very important. During things like water main breaks, where flooding of underground facilities may have in the past resulted in an outage, we've worked to make that waterproof and submersible. And round numbers, we, we think we've already avoided about 200,000 customer outages as a result of the resiliency improvements that we've placed in service. So if I remember correctly, it wasn't the strength of Sandy, it was the tidal surge that created the issue, right? I think it was still a flirted with a tropical storm category one. It was the surge that created such a, a problem. So two parts of the Sandy impact. First, on the overhead system, the places where we have poles, Staten Island, Westchester, Orange, and Rockland County, there it was the winds. Um, the winds just tore apart trees, took down the electric system with it. That was a good portion of where the customer impact was. The other was flooding. And it's a, it was a combination of full moon, tidal surge, the direction the winds were coming in at, and the, uh, the strength of the winds. It was a, you know, it's called Superstorm Sandy. It was a tropical storm by the time it, it hit um, New York, but right at the edge of hurricane, um, hurricane source winds. So you put it all together, and you know, the, the term the perfect storm, um, by the way, it didn't feel that perfect to us. Um, um, and I'm sure not to you, uh, it, 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 it didn't amount to um, really an unprecedented amount of flooding. Okay, perfect. Well, if we want to talk about disasters, what you read in the paper all the time, is, or more, more recently, is cyber attacks. And uh, James Comey of the FBI said there are two types of American companies, ones that have been attacked and ones that don't know they've been attacked. So I would assume that either state-sponsored espionage or ransomware uh, Con Ed is a prime target for disruption, if you will, if they can. So is that something that concerns you? Are you preparing for it? Yeah, so that is a, something that tremendously concerns us, and we put a tremendous amount of effort into preparing for it. Um, when, you, when you think of how to disrupt um, normal life, society, normal actions in our country, uh, the energy systems is, is pretty high on the list, and if you think of a place where you'd like to do it, New York is likely on the short list there as well. So we take it um, from a perspective of we need to be ready for the best that anybody's got to offer. And frankly, it, it, you know, we, we see um, attempted penetrations, not attacks, but a, attempted hacking into our system on a daily basis of significant amount, included from countries like China and Russia and North Korea and the like. Um, nothing new there, plenty of other companies see that as well. Um, our strategy is laid out around, around four elements, um, prevent, detect, mitigate, and recover. Prevention is what you spend most of the time talking about. Do you have the right firewalls? Do you have the right security mechanisms? Um, do you separate your networks so, so that if they get into one portion of it, maybe the email portion, they can't get into another portion, like the part that controls the electric and gas and steam systems? Um, we have all that, um, and of course, we work to make sure that we 
um, challenge ourselves. Um, we hire hackers to try and get into our system. We benchmark very significantly with not only other utilities, but other industries. And probably the thing, one of the things we benefit from the most is we have a, a really strong um, relationship with law enforcement. FBI, Secret Service, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Energy at the federal level, uh, at the city and state level, um, NYPD, Cyber Terrorism Task Force and the like. And um, they, have, they really help us not only identify what is the nature of the current threat, um, because that's one of the things about cyber, the, the, the threat changes on right. a routine basis. You know, last year this time, I don't think anybody knew what a distributed denial of service attack was um, using the internet of things uh, until it happened. Um, and so your, your protection mechanisms have to be um, advancing as quickly as the nature of the threat. Um, but a little bit on detect, uh, mitigate, and recover. Um, you know, I think the quote said uh, something along the lines of, they don't know that they've been penetrated yet. Correct. Most cyber attacks don't occur the day of that they hacked in. It's usually three to six months afterwards. Um, you could see this in, in you know, many of the popular attacks. The attack on Sony didn't occur. Um, it occurred the day of the release of a movie that was North Korea was, was, did not look upon fondly. Um, you know, that, they didn't just break in that day. They, in all likelihood, were already in. Same thing with the Christmas Day attacks on Game Box and the other, the other um, uh, game toys that, that are available. And so you need to have detection mechanisms that are looking at the traffic, which computer is talking to which, which one's at a higher utilization rate, which one's dialing out in a way that's inconsistent with the way that other servers dial out, or more so than it used to historically, or more so than we can understand for its function. A lot around detection, so you can find it if it is inside before it finds you. Yeah, pattern analysis. Yeah, very much so. Um, and, and analytics have really evolved there to make so much of that um, automated now that it's really very helpful. Uh, and then um, the last two, uh, you know, uh, many large organizations with national stature and, and in many cases law enforcement and, and military pedigree have been penetrated. So you got to go into it assuming that you're going to have to mitigate, you're going to have to respond to it, you got to have procedures and processes to help isolate it to as quickly as possible, drop off the parts of the systems that are contaminated, and be able to if manually, if necessary, still to be able to operate our energy systems. And then finally, a recovery um, strategy. You could lose thousands of servers. Um, Aramco is a, a good example where they lost tens of thousands of servers. Um, where are you going to get that from? Um, where are you going to get the technicians to be able to handle that type of level of work? Um, one of the things that, that the electric utility industry has is, um, that I think is fairly unique, is, is called mutual assistance. So traditionally mutual assistance was that when somebody has an overhead storm and the poles are down, um, if it happens in Pennsylvania, everybody sends their alignment to, to Pennsylvania. And that's existed for decades. Um, now we've established that from a cyber perspective. So if one utility um, gets hacked and has to do a major rebuild of their system, we have the pr protocols and the pre-approvals in so that other utilities can send their, their system analysts and technicians to help accelerate the recovery. And if possible, to lend resources like servers and routers right. and the like. So John, we're actually cruising along and I got the sign that it's 10 minutes before questions begin because I did want to talk about Fordham Prep and some of the, uh, again, uh, I guess STEM, right? We talk about the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Your hiring managers, are they seeing candidates that are more prepared, less prepared? Uh, could you give us a little insight into the types of folks that you're hiring and the qualifications that you're looking for? So um, a, a little bit on um, how we look from an employee side. Um, something's kind of surprising to me. One of the things that people, when, when I hired into the company um, in 1980, most people stayed for their whole careers. Um, they, you, you came to the company, if you like doing this kind of work, you stayed for the duration, and, and I'm an example of that. Um, and that's, that was true of many companies um, then. And um, many have seen that that changed. We have not seen that change yet, um, which is almost remarkable to me. Um, and I think there's, there's a, our, our, our attrition rate is pretty much the same as it was. And we have a lot of theories. We have no proven theories as to why, it, why that is. But I think there's a couple of reasons. Um, first is we give our people a lot of responsibility. 
um, relatively early on in their careers. And that seems to be something that for the people who, who work with us, they, 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 they um, not only take advantage of it, um, but they, it use, they, they use it to drive them to look for even more responsibility. Um, second, of course, compensation and pay has to be competitive, um, particularly in a high cost area like New York. Um, and the third, um, and this is, again, theory, but you know, we get to do a really special thing. Um, even though we are a publicly listed shareholder owned company, uh, we get to serve, we are really a public service company. We get to serve um, the greatest city in the world um, with, with work that is inherently important. Um, you, you, you don't have to read a book to know how important what, what we do does. And unfortunately, from time to time, we get reminded when it's not there of the dramatic impact it has on, on our city and our, and our communities and our society. That's a pretty neat thing to have in a career, um, knowing that you're doing something that really makes a difference. So our, our, our attrition patterns really haven't changed that much. The incoming workers, though, have changed very significantly um, uh, in, in a number of ways. First, uh, uh, we've worked in, and been successful at having a much more diverse organization. Uh, and with that diversity comes a, a lot of richness, a lot of breadth, a lot of innovation. Um, and the, the challenge that we're really focused on more now is one of inclusion. Um, how do you make sure that, I well, think you have a real diverse organization, that you have an environment that really makes everyone feel included, um, everyone feel welcome, everyone's part of the team, because that's where you get the maximum employee engagement. And we've come a long way and we're doing great in a lot of ways, but I'll, I'll, I'll share with you, we have more work to do there to create the environment that we really want that will continue to allow employees to, to be engaged at, at an even higher level. Um, one of the things I, I think is common to many large organizations that you don't see in smaller companies, th there is an element of discretionary effort that employees can choose to give or not to give. Um, you, you, you can, in all likelihood, survive at the, media, at the mediocre level putting out 80% or 85% for some substantial period of time in a real large organization. Um, or you can be really engaged and excited about what you're doing and you can put out 130%. Um, the difference is, is largely related to how employees feel about the company, if they feel they're trusted and respected, how they um, feel the company feels about them. And so we're really working to um, change the entire relationship we have with our employees. So one question, if you were able to con contribute your thoughts on the prep curriculum, what do you think, what would be an area that you would recommend that the prep or other schools focus on so the students that are graduating who are going to college can they, you know, jump in and do, you know, not only want to give 130%, but can give 130%? So my recollection of the prep curriculum was that it was pretty impressive. And uh, I, I benefited in many ways, probably because I went to engineering school and I, w I went to Manhattan College and it was a very straightforward curriculum. And frankly, other than religion class, I don't think you, you stepped class. There, there was a whole lot of liberal arts. Um, I know there wasn't a single English class. And so whatever, whatever broad exposure I had to the world in general, and, to, and I'll come back to English and literature because I think it's so important. I got it to prep. I got zero of that uh, in college. And I think um, that was really valuable to me personally. I see Ms. Dahern here. Ms. Dahern was both my freshman mentor um, class, as a homeroom class uh, leader, and was also in sophomore year my English teacher. And I will tell you that the ability to communicate, no matter what you're going to do, in your career, and including being able to write well, is so substantially important. And the exposure to literature, my, my, uh, my wife went to, uh, my wife and I both born and raised in, in Parkchester in the Bronx. She went to uh, St. Raymond's Girls Academy and then College of Mount St. Vincent. Um, so very similar upbringing. And she will still to this day say, how do you know about that? And so I remember reading this, and it's like, damn, they didn't make us read any of that stuff. <laughs> She's mad about it. Um, she's like, you know, where were my English teachers? Where were my literary teachers? And uh, thanks to Mr. Ahern, and we, we talked about Jerome Warren earlier, 
Um, I think that's a, a, a really valuable um, addition, at least the really, uh, given, given that I went technical for college, um, was really valuable to me. Um, you, but you started off asking about STEM. Uh, you know, when you look at the, the statistics around engineering, um, the amount of progress we've made in terms of bringing in women and minorities is, is surprisingly poor. Um, women are about 15 to 20 percent of engineering graduates, um, about the same as it was 10 years ago, about the same as it was 20 years ago. At the same time when more women graduate college than men and professions like medical and law have as many if not more women graduating. So really low amounts of progress there and if you zone in on mechanical and electrical and civil engineering, the numbers are even less. It's down like 10 percent um, are, are women. So a lot of work to be done there. And minorities, similarly, uh, similarly poor performance. Uh, you know, uh, if you take Latinos, African Americans, and um, uh, Native Indians, and uh, Alaskan Natives, round numbers, I think it's about 30% of the population, less than 10% of the engineering workforce. Um, so there's a lot that we need to do there. One of my beliefs is, and I think um, many organizations feel that way, it has a lot to do with exposure to what a career in a STEM-like field will be like. Um, many of us are, know what it would be like to have a career in education because we're exposed to education. Many parts of the medical field, what it's like to be a doctor or a nurse, you're exposed to that as part of the normal ways of life. Um, law enforcement and, and, and um, a legal, the legal profession, um, they get more than their share of TV shows and, uh, and really good movies. And even business gets some movies. You know, I, I challenge you to name, name a TV show or a, uh, or a movie where an engineer is the hero or heroine. Um, well, there's it, hope. It, it, they just <laughs> came out with the accountant, the movie, so. Yeah. <laughs> so there's not a whole lot of exposure to what it's like to have a career in, in many of the STEM fields. And many of our programs, um, Con Edison's program, is we're working to reach out very much um, at the grammar school and high school level to help explain what a career is like in our company and in STEM in general, and particularly to focus on women and minorities so that we can potentially um, help uh, turn the tides and provide more interest in, in, that, um, in, in becoming uh, a long-term STEM career worker. Thank you. So John, we have the business club here, and they, uh, they'd like to ask a few questions. So uh, gentlemen, since you haven't graduated yet, I know you're off in the corner, uh, please. Ask any questions. Oh, um, circling back to uh, green and renewable energy, how do you think uh, New York's prepared for cheaper solar and possibly rooftop solar on homes and how the system's going to work with it? So um, let me tell you a little bit about my, my company's uh, activities around renewables. Um, we, we, we have three lines of business. One of them is the kind of that you all know. One of them is Orange and Rockland Utilities, or, or Regulated Utility too. Our completely separate business is our clean energy business. We have uh, solar and wind in 13 states across the country. We are the fifth largest solar producer in North America. Um, in, in the Southwest, we have very large solar facilities. Um, our largest facility is about 30 miles outside of Las Vegas. It's 3,000 acres. And if, uh, you know, if a solar panel is, you know, round numbers two and a half feet by six feet, it's 1.1 million solar panels. That's just one of our facilities. Um, we have wind in South Dakota, Nebraska, um, Minnesota. We have much more solar in, in as well as in Texas, um, Southern California and the like. And we have smaller solar in the um, in Northeast. So we are all in on renewables. Um, we do it for two reasons. Um, one, because we see it's such a large part of where the energy and in this country is, is headed. And um, in addition to doing what we currently do well, we want to make sure that we are learning tomorrow's technology, becoming good at it, and, and becoming competitive at it. And two, the great earnings opportunities for us, because it's growth in addition to growing Con Ed and ONR, the utilities, the growth opportunities for us. Um, New York State has... Um, has that, the renewable energy standard that I mentioned, clean energy standard, 50% by 2030. Um, it's going to take a very significant build out of renewables in the state to accomplish that. 
It can come from a host of different areas, and that's still to be determined. It could come from Canadian Hydro if we decide that we, we want Canadian Hydro, and there's a lot of pros and cons going with Canadian Hydro. Um, it could come from large wind farms, which would largely be the north or western parts of the state or offshore, um, or it can come from large solar facilities. Uh, rooftop solar is a part of it, and, and we do some rooftop solar, although um, not a whole lot, um, but we do some. Uh, clearly, if you're going to make large changes in the energy infrastructure to, to incorporate more solar, large-scale solar projects are much better. They're about 50% the cost of rooftop solar. And so if we're going to make a real change in our energy economy, and we want to do it in a way that is the lowest possible cost for customers, large-scale solar projects long-term is the way to go. My name is Lou Ide Allen. I'm from the class of 56. And no, although I may look like it was 1856, it's uh, 1956. And there are actually four of us here, three at a table down there and in here. Uh, before I ask the question, to give you some assurance, I want to remind everyone in the room that what's said at a prep function remains within the prep community. But we're and streaming. Yeah. And if yeah. any, any, anyone yeah. violates... Remember, that's what that auditor of PWC <laughs> thought the other night, too. <laughs> if anyone violates that, the wrath of the former disciplinarian, Arthur Shea, will come down upon you, I tell you that. And if you don't know who that was and what his wrath entails, <laughs> ask any of us golden years <laughs> graduates. My question is, what are your personal feelings about our country pursuing fracking? Is it worth it, or is the potential danger and harm far outweigh any benefit? And just the second thing, point of information, does Con Ed have a program whereby they will replace free of charge homeowners' light bulbs with the more efficient, energy-saving LED bulbs? Thank you. Right. So um, one of the, th this, there's so many great parts to being a long-term Con Ed employee and to having the privilege of being CEO, but, but one of the things you give up is the right to have a personal opinion. <laughs> so um, w w as a company, we, are, we do not have a role in the production of natural gas. Um, we, we buy natural gas at the transmission pipeline level. We buy it from wherever it is produced safely, reliably, and economically in accordance with all local laws and we do not take a position on what production method is appropriate. Similarly, on the electric side, we, we largely are out of the electric generation business. We only really only have our steam plants. That was part of deregulation in New York State, and so we don't take a position on nuclear power versus other types of power plants as well. Um, we have an opinion like everyone else, but frankly, no one's interested because it's not our, it's, it is not our role. Um, on uh, energy efficiency, uh, uh, I, I touched on renewables a couple of times. Uh, energy efficiency in so many ways we find for our service territory is even better than renewables. Um, more cost efficient and provides longer lasting value to our customers. And so we have, um, we, we don't give fr straight up free light bulbs, except in certain circumstances. There are some cases where we have, um, but we have energy efficiency programs for every type of customer, from single family, residential, apartment or homeowner, right up to large commercial and, and, uh, and residential buildings, the like of which are you know, in this area of Manhattan. And we, we put about 40 to $50 million into those programs every year to, to subsidize and uh, provide rebates for energy efficiency. And our customers, it, it, it is the, one of the best win-win-wins because they reduce their bills they reduce their impact on the environment, and we reduce to have the need for more generating sources. And so um, we're, we are, we've been doing energy efficiency programs like that well over 10 years now. We are going to, in fact, we just, um, for the next three years, starting in 2017, we increase the amount we're investing significantly, and we're going to keep doing that going forward. Other questions? We have our last question from one of our students over here. My name is Owen Lombardi, I'm the class of 2017. Um, in macroeconomics, we've learned a lot about aggregate supply and aggregate demand. And um, 
We were just wondering how changes in OPEC oil prices affect Con Ed and how you respond to those effects in order to maintain the price level as well as the purchasing power of your employees and customers. So I was worried you were going to ask me to describe aggregate supply and aggregate demand <laughs> there and macroeconomic theory. Mr. Ahern, are you available? That was, that was close. Um, uh, we do. We do not, and frankly, New York State does not largely use fuel oil to, to um, generate electricity. So the only places really that we use oil is in a fleet as a, uh, for our trucks and, and vans. And there we increasingly use, um, I think probably about 40% of our fleet uses alternate fuels now between biodiesel, um, uh, hybrids, full electric, and compressed natural gas vehicles. So it does not have a dramatic impact on us um, directly, um, but it does change the equation between uh, customers who choose to heat the home with oil or to heat the home with natural gas. And uh, what we are increasingly seeing is customers who want to shift to natural gas. Two main reasons for that. It's cheaper and is expected to be cheaper for many years and it's so much more environmentally friendly. Um, Round numbers at, at any given time over the last couple of years, uh, natural gas about half the price of fuel oil alternatives, and so many, in particular, large buildings um, are moving over from fuel oil to natural gas. And from an environmental perspective, it's about 40% um, less carbon emissions, um, no sulfur dioxides, 40% no, less not nitrogen oxide, and no particulates. And you know, when we when we talk about air emissions. Uh, carbon is the thing that most things get measured by, and appropriately so. But for a densely populated city like New York, local air quality is extremely important. And the, the difference in local air quality as a result of burning natural gas, um, as, which, which has basically no ozone precursors, as compared to burning fuel oil, is very, very significant. Um, New York City was determined to have the cleanest air it's had in 50 years in 2016. And conversion from uh, fuel oil to natural gas is certainly a part of that. Well, John, thank you. Thanks, thank you. We've hit our time. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Jim. John, it was very. Good conversation. Um, sorry we didn't have time to take more questions. I know many of you have them, but um, it was a lively conversation and, and, and close, to, uh, close to my heart at the prep because uh, I know that uh, if you graduated prior to 1972, you talk about our, our, the, the building we inhabit as the new building, but it's not new. And um, we're, uh, we're, we're making a lot of changes. Actually, very interesting to hear about solar because we are partnering, thanks to our, our strong relationship with Fordham University, we are partnering with a, a solar farm in Staten Island uh, and, and, and a third party, and Mike Higgins, our, our CFO, has really worked very hard on this. It's going to take our, our uh, energy costs way down, and uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it was good to hear that that seems to be the, uh, the way of the future. Um, a couple other uh, people I want to thank. Uh, Paul Frank has sponsored our attendance at the Harvard Club. Uh, and uh, uh, so thank you to Paul. I, I, I think you're here somewhere in the building. Yes. Thank you, Paul. You know, we're, uh, we're, we're blessed to have John Freeman here, too. We go back and forth between Yale and Harvard. So it's, uh, it's been a good, good rivalry. Um, so uh, uh, good, good spots for us to be able to host these events, and we're very grateful for, uh, cer certainly for, for, for your support. Paul Williams is here. He has attended a record 14 Wall Street forums. Where are you? There you are, Paul. <laughs> Several of you have um, sponsored the, the lunches. This is an upgrade from the commons. You might be surprised to know that. But uh, for, for our, uh, our young men who are here today, um, uh, so I want to thank uh, those who, who sponsored students, um, Kathleen Nowicki, Terrence Fay, class of 88, John Freeman, 80, uh, Bill McCabe, class of 75, Jim Murray, 85, Bill Rizzo, uh, 86, and Sparrows Vanglados, 07, all of you um, sponsored seats for our students to be able to join us. 
and I know it was uh, impactful for, for you guys to be, to be able to step out of the campus and, and know you could learn something uh, just by coming to the Harvard Club and spending some time with people like John McAvoy and Jim Rowan. Um, like you to consider uh, um, some events, and we put cards at your table for things that are coming up. Rowan and Tynan concert, less than two weeks. We have over 700 tickets sold. We're anticipating a great evening, and we hope that you would consider joining us. Um, we will have brunch uh, back here at the Harvard Club. Seems to be a, a popular destination for us. Um, and we're going to march up Fifth Avenue. This, the brunch and the, and the parade happen, of course, on St. Patrick's Day. The last time the Ford and Prep marched in the St. Patrick's Day parade was over 20 years ago. So it's good that we can uh, particularly have a, a way to mark and celebrate 175 years, the Dodren's uh, bicentennial um, T.A. is your brother Joe. He prefers the Latin because he went to Regis. That's okay. But uh, we, 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 we talk about it as our 175th, um, which is great. Uh, so we'll be celebrating on, on St. Patrick's Day. Our annual golf outing, you'll see information about that at your table. Um, we, we were just able to book uh, La Serena, which is a great spot um, for you and your wives to come and, and celebrate the 175th. We're going to have a dinner dance celebration at La Serena. It's downtown Maritime Hotel. It's owned, co-owned by Joe Bassianich, class of 85. And uh, that, will be, that will be a great evening. That's going to be in second week in May. We're still confirming the date. We'll get details to you uh, shortly on that. And then April 2nd, um, with America Media, we're able to co-sponsor a forum on faith and racial justice. And we, we invite you to come to the prep. Uh, April 2nd is a Sunday. 3 p.m. We'd like you to come. We have lined up some top-rate scholars, uh, university scholars, um, as well as uh, alumni uh, in this space who who both study and comment in this space. And I think it'll be uh, it'll be a great a great way to spend an afternoon. We invite you and your families to consider being with us for for that. Um, Want to thank uh, so many people who helped make this afternoon possible. Um, our Vice President Jose Gonzalez. Our CFO, Mike Higgins, and the business club that was able to be with us today. Suzanne Dowden, uh, Aaron Trainer, um, CJ uh, Johnson, um, who uh, does video for us. And today is actually his last day. He's moving up to the, uh, the leafy environs of Dartmouth. Um, so we're, we're grateful for, for CJ's work among us, Larry Curran, and of course, Dennis. It's great to hear a call out from the speaker, Dennis, for, for the great work you did um, teaching John and his classmates and so many generations of, of Fordham Prep young men. So thank, thank you to all of you. Um, lastly, uh, we, um, one of the particular passions of our chairman was the design of a 175th commemorative stein, a beer stein. Let me just, uh, can we just have a, uh, a show of hands? How many people have the stein? Okay, so we gotta do, well, there's a lot of selling that needs to go on today. Uh, the Stein was, it's unbelievable. Do, do we have it displayed out here? We did? Oh, it's right here. Oh, wow. Here you go, right? You, it might be hard to see right here, but let me tell you, this is uh, it's an amazing piece of work. For $500, $500 donation, this Stein is yours, and you want it to be yours. By the way, you can actually drink from it. Great, uh, great Stein. I'm going to put it down here. I don't want to drop it. But... Um, we, uh, so we have a, we want you to consider a $500 donation to Ford and Prep for a Stein, but I think we're doing a raffle, aren't we? Is, uh, is Tommy McCarthy, can, oh, there you are. All right, so uh, how are we doing this? Oh, right, here, here. Erin will help us. She, she. So someone's going to win a Stein right now. This is a very exciting moment. Thomas, come on forward. Lots of exciting things. Um, so thank you. Uh, thanks especially to, to, to John. Thank you for bringing your brother Bernie. Thank, thank you to Jim uh, and, so, and John, so many of your classmates who came out to, to be with you today as well as uh, all of you. Um, thanks for coming to our Wall Street Forum, spending some time with us. Uh, God bless. And uh, it, is, it is Mardi Gras. Lent begins tomorrow, Ash Wednesday. Uh, but, uh, but thank you. For everything you do for the prep, thank you for being here today, and thank you for your loyalty and support to our mission. God bless.
Thank you.